So uh, what we've got here is uh, sort of a workshop. And I see a lot of you have laptops, uh, and that's great because we can get you set up to, to set this up on your laptop right now. Uh, so how many people have heard of, the, heard of the Linux kernel memory model? All right. Uh, those of you who didn't raise your hand, I'm impressed. You got here uh, so uh, impressed with your investigative and uh, curiosity and all that. Uh, how many people have used it before? Great. I'll be calling you guys uh, if we need more people to help with, with things, since you've obviously installed it to do that. Well, not necessarily. I suppose you could have used it uh, when somebody else installed it. So uh, there's that possibility. And uh, how many people have, like, written limits tests or done anything like that? Okay, we got, all right, great. We got a few there. All right, but let's uh, take one step at a time here if I can. Ooh, look at that. Page down works today. So this is kind of what the, what the Linux kernel memory model is, just the pieces of it. So uh, we have litmus tests, and these are little kind of like C code snippets. They're very small. Uh, the reason they're very small is this thing is doing the moral equivalent of a full state space search. Uh, so you got this concurrent code, and it's working out everything that could possibly happen, given the constraints of the Linux kernel memory model. Uh, and that sort of thing, uh, given any kind of Turing complete language, on a good day, it's exponential. Okay? On a bad day, it's undecidable. Um, fortunately, we have restrictions on what you can put in the C code. Uh, we don't have functions, we don't have loops, uh, and so on. And so we end up in a state where we are always exponential. Uh, well, I suppose, uh, yeah, I don't know how you could be linear in this thing. All right, you're doing too much work. I suppose if you just had one store and that was it, it could be linear. Linear in what, though? I'm not sure. Um, so anyway, so that's what we're doing. We're doing something that analyzes little dinky snippets of programs and tells you everything that could possibly happen if those snippets of programs are run concurrently. It's, uh, it's not like it, it, it dumps everything out. What you, what, the way it works is you ask it a question, and we'll get into that later. Now, there's a tool called Herd7. And we have to install that, unless you already have. And it runs in a language called OCaml. All right? And then, uh, so we've got kind of a couple levels of code here. We've got OCaml, which is an interpreter. We've got Herd7, which provides a, a memory model language, as you will. And we have the memory model itself, which is in a tools memory model in your Linux source tree. How many people have a Linux source tree on the laptop they have right now? Okay, got it. good. You guys are ahead of the game. You already you don't, don't realize that, but you have the Linux kernel memory model already installed, or at least part of it. Um, you've got the the left side over there. Okay, so given that kind of is what we're trying to do, um, we have we'll we'll have this on a slide later. But this is kind of telling you how you get this stuff. OCaml is a language. Normally, you can get it from your distro. So if you have a Debian-based thing, something to the effect of uh, uh, sudo apt get install OCaml, we'll get it to you. Uh, maybe DNF in there somewhere if you're running Fedora and there's enough distros. I don't, I'm sorry, I can't keep track of all the packaging things, but I bet we have people here uh, who, who know. And if you're running a given distro, you probably know it's packaging, so that'll help. You can install OCaml from source, but if you're doing that, by the end of this 45 minutes, you'll have OCaml running, okay? Or maybe you got a faster laptop these days. That was my experience last I tried it. Uh, it used to be you had to because uh, Herd 7 was new and it required a recent OCaml, which wasn't yet in the distros, but that those days are eight years ago. So these days you'd be able to grab a thing from a distro and be happy. Okay, once you've got that, we're gonna, uh, there's a GitHub thing, Herd 7, Herd 7 tools, and we can clone that. And that build is fairly quick. It's a little bit cranky, but it, but it works fairly well. There's, uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more. And then uh, you've already got, most of you already have a Linux kernel source tree. If you don't, you can clone that quickly enough. And either way, uh, we, there are litmus tests in the Linux kernel source tree, so you can use those. But if you want to, if that's not enough for it, if a few tens of them aren't enough, we got several thousand of them over here in this uh, GitHub repository. Most of them automatically generated, thankfully. Quite a few by hand. Okay, so this is kind of the procedure that you would go through. So this is kind of the previous slide, but just set down there. 
Um, these slides you can download. What you do is you go to the schedule, you pick this session, you click on the title, and then you get the PDF, and that way you can cut and paste instead of just typing it. Of course, if you like a typing challenge, you know, uh, don't let me turn, turn you away from it. You can type it straight from the slide if you prefer. Okay, um, so the first step is install it from distro. Um, how many people already have OCaml installed? All right, hey, look at that. I've never, I haven't written much in OCaml, but some people have, that's good. Um, uh, could you guys please, if, how many people are having trouble finding OCaml or installing it at all? Okay, uh, if we do have problems, we'll point you at those guys so they can do it. And, uh, how many people are just along for the ride to watch other people struggle? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I kind of figured something like that. <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, how many people are actively installing OCaml right now or getting ready to? Okay, very good. We'll, we'll give you guys some time and, and uh, let that happen. I'm sorry? Uh, there's, there's OCaml. I, 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 I'm, I guess I uh, give the, give this guy, a, could you toss this guy a box so I can, we can all hear what he said. All right. Yeah, there we are. There's some dependency in her that need also installed after OCaml. Yes. Uh, for example, uh, you need to have uh, Dune, men here. Uh, and, uh, I, I managed to paste that twice. Uh, so uh, there's this min here opam. Uh, just stop at the R and min here, okay? So you, have you used this thing before? Oh, okay. He just got ahead of the game and got to the installed at MD. Very good. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's good show. Very good. So uh, let's see here. I'll fix that while people are installing. I will fix that and re-upload the slide, and hopefully that won't disrupt things too much. We'll see how it goes. So how are people doing installing OCaml? Let me put it this way. How many people are still working on installing a camel that are going to install it? How many people successfully installed a camel in the last little bit? Yeah, look at that. That's all right. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, what's it doing to you? Uh, could, could you? Could you? Could you? <laughs> when I installed men here using OPAM, it, it put a binary in my, uh, or put a, you know, a program in my home directory, but it's buried down in some path that's yes. not in my path. So it make all once, once the path, uh, once that in your path. And so you have to find it. And Is, isn't there a thing in install MD where you have to do something to tell it to use that stuff or something like that? I just used OPAM install yeah. to, to do the min here okay, and, and me... several other things. And one of the binaries, it apparently wants the, the make, uh, when you, once you do make all after that for the herd tools, uh -huh. it wants uh, men here to be in your path. Okay. Yeah. There was, I thought there was something where it would, uh... yeah. Okay. So after it says OPAM install dune men here in, uh, in oh, yeah. installed MD. Galaxy. Yeah, there you are. Do yeah, that. I that yeah, I, I should have put it up here. I I'm, I apologize. Anyway, the hit trick is you, and I'll I'll say it, uh, but please look at it in the file itself, okay? And please copy and paste it unless you really want to demonstrate your typing skill, which is I suppose okay. Uh, what you have to do is in op opam. Excuse me. After opam install dune min here, you have to say back quote eval space dollar sign open paren. OPAM config env, close parent, back quote. <laughs> uh, I strongly suggest copying and pasting unless you're serious about demonstrating your typing prowess. Yeah. With that, I'm, uh, it's building now. So okay, that, very that, good. That seems to do it for me. Okay, glad I asked. Anybody else uh, having difficulty with, uh, with building uh, the next step, which is uh, building HERD7, HERD7 tools? How, yeah, let's. Uh, okay, great. Uh, throw, throw this guy. Throw this guy a box, <laughs> or take it to him. That's fine too. It's telling me library Zareth not found. Library Zareth. Can you spell that for me? Z Z A R I T H. Okay. Um, uh, my immediate reaction would be try opem install Zareth. Does anybody anybody know any better than that? 
Okay. So on a boon, uh, what 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 district are you running? Uh, Crostini. Say again. Crostini, like Chrome OS. Oh, okay. Chrome OS. Okay. Um, try uh, try installing as the gentleman over there suggested. Try installing using the distro install for Zara C A R A T H, and uh, that one's a bit of a new one on me. But then it's been I've I'm had doing, her to install. I'm, I'm doing I'm doing uh, Open install Zareth, and that appears to work. Okay. All right. Great. This is always an adventure. Every time I try it, I learn something new about uh, about this stuff. Actually, what it means is that uh, Herd 7 tools is under active development and they do new things, which is not a bad thing. Okay, any other, uh, there was, I thought I saw somebody suggesting they're having a little bit of trouble with, uh, with stuff. Either they're being very shy or they figured it out. Or they just like being frustrated and Keeping the head against the wall, which, well, if I didn't indulge in that occasionally, I wouldn't have ever gotten RC where it is today. So, <laughs> what can I say? All right. Um, let's see here. So, I'm going to let that go for a little bit. I'm going to, uh, uh, this is kind of last minute presentation, which I apologize. I'm going to try to find a presentation where I talk about what a litmus test and what the pieces of it are while people are finishing that up. I know I gave one a couple months ago. I just have to find it. Does anyone know how to install Herd 7? Because it seemed to have built successfully, but when I do make install, it says uh, Dune missing. So um, it says which now? Um, so make for um, Herd Tool 7 mm -hmm. finished successfully. So I do make install, sudo make install, and it tells me uh, Dune not found. Uh, I, yeah, I never have installed it uh, other than in my home directory. So. Uh, Send me a client. So can I install? Okay. So so. Uh, yeah. So if you try not, as what happens, I guess, is the first thing. Oh, right. Because you do root, you're a different user, and suddenly you don't have your OPAM environment. <laughs> Thank exactly, you. Because I did sudo. <laughs> okay. Uh, or you have to just give yourself a root shell, do OPAM and if you're really gutsy, <laughs> do OPAM install, and then uh, and then install it. It's a VM. I can break it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, get a grab a catch box. There's one behind you, or okay, there's one right there. Very good. Uh, I have a question. Uh, the the current uh, the current uh, um, the current uh, primitive only have the uh, read write uh, uh, read acquire store release as you read as you okay yeah, uh, and uh, spin lock spin unlock right correct. But I see you GitHub uh, uh, rep, repo. You have the atomic. Uh, uh, primitive uh, uh, litmus. So, what, so, what, so what, what time you would uh, put that into the kernel? And uh, actually, uh, how we guarantee the atomic primitives in the kernel side? So, uh, let's rewind a little bit. There's a file in tools memory model called Linux kernel.def, Linux kernel.def. And that has macros. And you just look in there, you can see which primitives the memory model itself currently supports if that's what your question is. Apparently that wasn't what your question was. Or. So you, uh, you mean that they have contained this uh, atomic pr primitives, right? Uh, I'm not gonna tell you that, um, Test. that the Linux kernel memory model has every primitive that's been ever invented in Linux. I mean, there's, there is some, it is behind a little bit. But for example, um, uh, uh, atomic test and set is there. Uh, yeah, the common ones you use are there. RCU is there, RCU read lock, RCU read unlock. Spin locks are there, uh, spin lock, spin unlock. Read or write or locks are not there yet. SRCU is there, but uh, task trace RCU and uh, task RCU and uh, root RCU are not there yet. So it's, the, as the gentleman here said, the most common stuff is there. Uh, but what were you asking, what, what were you looking for specifically that you did not find? Uh, uh, uh... It's another question, maybe not so related to the kernel memory model. So uh, the actually we have the atomic primitive, right? But the implementing implemented the atomic uh, some architecture would uh, use some load reserve store condition. That means it's not uh, only one instruction to mapping. 
And uh, that means they have the risk of the, for the guarantee, sometimes with the loop delay in this atomic. So how could we prevent this guarantee? Oh, we can detect this risk. So let me try to see if I understand your question first, um, since I've tried a couple times now and I've been missing. Um, one thing you may be saying is, look, the semantics and memory ordering of the atomic primitives in Linux vary depending on what architecture you're on. Is that is that one of your key points? Yeah, I mean, some atomic uh, primitive implemented with the load store, uh, load reserve store condition, just two yeah. pairs of. So, but this kind of instru instructions is not real at atomic uh, uh, instructions. They are have some risk of the loop. of the failing. Okay, so okay, so let me try to state your question again and see if I understand it. Uh, what you're saying is, you know, look, uh, compare and, let's take compare exchange, CMP, XCG. That's implemented in the Linux kernel memory model, also in the Linux kernel, all right? And uh, different architectures implement differently. x86, there's a CMP, XCG instruction that just does it, right? Um, and uh, in uh, ARM, uh, you have to use uh, LibreX and Strex, if I remember the instructions correctly. PowerPC, uh, you have LWARCs and Stux. I can't pronounce it, but that's okay. Uh, not meant to be pronounceable. Um, so we have these different ways to implement these atomic primitives. How the heck does the Linux kernel memory model get away with just saying, you know, CMPXGG, what, what's going on there? And what's going on there is that the Linux kernel memory model, by definition, is giving is showing you the least common denominator of the architectures, all right? So for example, if you were to say, all right, I've got a... Uh, uh, I've got a uh, uh, an atomic ink, all right, which is just an atomic ink. It just increments. It doesn't return anything, and it does not guarantee any ordering, right? And on ARM and PowerPC, it might not have any ordering. On x86, it does. It's fully ordered. So what the Linux kernel memory model is going to tell you is it's going to tell you according to the definition, which is no ordering. So the Linux kernel memory model would tell you things could be reordered, and on x86 they might not be able to. But that's okay. It's okay for an architecture to provide primitives that are stronger than required. Is that what you're getting at, or, or am I still losing track of what the question is? Uh, you 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 answered from other direction to not directly <laughs> I, I, answer. I, I think the question is more of uh, how you guarantee the architecture implement those uh, primitives correctly so that they can hold the um, ordering requirement for the Linux kernel memory model. Okay, so, uh, so you're ask, let me try to restate that and see if we've got things here. So I'm implementing atomic printers for new architecture. Uh, we made a new architecture, it's there, and we want to implement the primitives. We want to make sure that the Linux kernel uh, works correctly, so we want to make the right Functions. How do I how do I verify that I've in fact done that? Is that the question? Uh, I uh, my question is uh, uh, yes um, the load reserve stock stock condition this pair of the use this pair instruction to implement the atomic actually mm -hmm. it's not uh, the same with other architectures implementation. They are they have different they uh, they have some potential risk. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so the problem is in our litmus test, how to detect this risk. Okay, so uh, let me. Uh, so, such as the atomic uh, uh, operation pending there, and mm -hmm. cannot continue. So, are you asking about forward progress? Yeah. Uh, this does not deal with forward progress. Forward progress is I mean, it just. So, let me try to state it again and make sure I'm really understand what you're saying. Okay, so, um, and. I'm going to I'm going to focus on x86 and ask your question on x86. All right, x86. You have a single instruction come exchange, and that's a single instruction. If when I ran that instruction, where I had the cache line shared only among two CPUs uh -huh. on an eight socket machine, uh -huh. it took a microsecond, one microsecond for that instruction to execute, just with the two CPUs involved. Clearly, at the hardware level, there's much, much more going on than just a single instruction that just kind of happens, right? There's all sorts of stuff happening. So you can apply the ask that same question of x86. How do we know the hardware people did the right thing 
to provide forward progress on the compare exchange instruction. Right? Yeah, it's uh, come. Yeah, it's it's the outline that like this. Right, and so by the same token, I mean it's the same question for both architectures. It's not like x86 has a pure advantage in terms of forward progress. It's just an x86 the forward progress is pushed down to the microcode and the hardware level. In the case of something like ARM or PowerPC, where you have a where you have a Lark Stokes loop, and those can always fail, right? I mean, you can come up with some conditions where you might be able to prove they couldn't because you're only you're the only CPU accessing that structure. Even then, you could have interrupts or something like that, or NMIs that could that could cause it trouble, right? Um, but then you just have the question additionally at the other level. Okay, um, I've got the hardware doesn't do the right thing. I've got my little loop which clearly tests it and checks. All right. Well, how do I know the loop terminates? Yeah. Well, how do I know the hardware does the right thing? But that's the same question X six. How do I know the hardware does the right thing for the compare chain instruction, right? Or am I still miss? I, I'm 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 unsure of what you're asking at this point. I really am. So maybe maybe we can take this offline. That sounds like an this excellent idea. Really, uh, connected to the what we are doing. Yeah. Here. In any case, we don't we don't. This model does not deal with forward progress. It just assumes that the things eventually complete and are done correctly at the hardware level and also the software implementations and the architectures. But yeah, let's talk later and see what we got. All right. Um, so how many people uh, are trying to install CURD7 but haven't yet? See, uh, that was a great argument. It gave them time to get done. So thank you. <laughs> um, now, uh, inside the Linux kernel, there's tools, memory bottle, litmus tests. It has a few tens of litmus tests. Alternatively, if that's not enough for you, uh, there's that URL right there, github.com, Paul MCKRCU Litmus, and there's a few thousand of them down in there, that, uh, like 8,000, I think, last I checked. Um, either way, we need to find some litmus tests. And uh, the next slide I'm going to move to is going to show you how to run HERD7 once you have a litmus test. If you haven't got anything else, my suggestion is just grab a random litmus test inside that directory right there. Um, so let me page down over here. And uh, so you need to get into the tools memory model directory. Okay, so CD to wherever your source tree is, tools slash memory model. Once you're there, you can just type herd 7 conf linux kernel.cfg. And the linux kernel.cfg is just a file that means you don't have to type a whole pile of stuff on the command line, all right? <laughs> um, if you want to type on the command line, you can. I mean, that's fine. And then you give it the path to the litmus test in question. So you could, after that, you could type um, uh, litmus tests, which is a directory in that directory, slash randomly choose the name of a litmus test there. If you do that, it should give you some output. Ooh. Oh, okay. I've never tried that. <laughs> yeah, nice. <laughs> this guy is serious. <laughs> Anybody having it just not being cooperative in some way or having trouble getting a file into it? Kind of strange. I actually have a, there's a make file at that level where you can say make and uh, check all litmus or something like that, which essentially does what you're saying, except uh, the litmus tests have a little comment in them saying what the expected value is, so it checks that as well. And I run that when somebody gives me a memory model change to make sure that it's a, kind of a touch test. For the serious test, I use the thing with 8,000 litmus tests and verify all those. Okay. Um, and one of the things I didn't do was go find, uh, so let's see, we got about uh, 10 minutes left. Um, so uh, I'll, you've got output. And so um, if you just pick the last one, I guess, which is probably still on your screen, you should see a sometimes a never or always in there somewhere. Yeah. So that so what's happening, and that you also see, see a, should see a funny formula with slashes and backslashes. The guys that did this are mathematicians, so a forward slash followed by backslashes and mathematical and. <laughs> <laughs> and a backslash followed by forward, forward slash is mathematical or, all right? Um, and so you should find a line that you don't see with something like that on there. 
or you're just nodding your head at their craziness. Uh, in their defense, the uh, that and and that were there before ampersand and vertical bar. But <laughs> what are you going to do? Uh, in any case, you should see a line like that, and that is the question that was being asked of Herd Seven about that litmus test. And if you and uh, and so if you edit a particular litmus test, grab a litmus test and edit it. At the very bottom, you'll see this line that says exists and has that funny formula. And you have equals and uh, til uh, tilde something equals something else. Uh, there's also some uh, some things there, but that that's kind of the question you're asking of it. And you'll see, uh, you it kind of looks like function definitions, p0, p1, p2, and so on. Um, you can name those anything you want, as long as the first letter, letter is a capital P, and they're numbered consecutively. And uh, in the formula, you'll see these like zero colon, one colon things. And the reason for that is you can have local variables in these processes. And the zero colon allows you to have R1 or R0 or something like that. Each one stands for register one, register zero is where it kind of came from. This thing's tool started off at the assembly language level. And so they think in terms of registers for a lot of the historical decisions. And that's kind of carried over. We use R0, R1, and so on as the temp variables by convention for no good reason. Um, but you don't have to, you could use a name, properly named variable, but either way you'd have to go, if you wanted the process zero one, you'd have to go zero colon, then the name of the local variable to identify that local variable in that process as opposed to something else to get the scope right. Um, you, you'll notice that the P zeros have parameters and those uh, parameters are the global variables. So, um, uh, there are global variables that are shared variables. You can just name them, uh, but you have to have that name in the parameter list. A common mistake to make is to leave out the global variable on the parameter list, and what it'll do is say, oh, you must have an undeclared local variable. I'm there for you. This being OCaml, right? I mean, uh, it's kind of C in the, inside that process, but only kind of. So um, we got about uh, nine minutes left. So we got we got success. We got a bunch of people install this. We got a bunch of people run it. That's that's great. Um, uh, what uh, do people have questions at this point about uh, how this stuff works or whatever? Yeah, we got two of them. We'll uh, we'll let the the whoever has a throw box decide who goes first. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I was just wondering if we could like walk through one of them to a litmus uh, test. Yeah, yes. the, probably the first one's the simplest. Uh, this so to I'll need to and... get help from soon because I need to get a litmus test here to project it for people. I was going to look for a presentation, but if we got a Linux kernel on that thing, we can just do that. <laughs> uh, it says so. It says Chrome. <laughs> hey, we need the source code though. <laughs> Uh, you want to project, uh, to show a litmus test. Uh, I, I, I wanted to project a file within the Linux kernel source tree, if that's easy. If it's not easy, well, while you're doing that, I'll uh, we'll just show a file. Yeah. Just, uh, All right. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Very good. Uh, pub. Oh right, we have to. We have to. We got may have remote people and people looking at this later. While you're doing that, I'll see if I can find a PDF that has a good description in it. There's an old science fiction story. Uh, I this usual space western thing, and uh, so the hero and the young guy, who's kind of the narrator, are in this horrible situation, and the the, the narrator says, "Hero, what do we do now?" Oh, I've been, you had a plan. Well, the plan doesn't cover this contingency. What? How can the plan not cover this contingency? Well, frankly, buddy boy, I never thought we got this far. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, that's uh, where I'm at right now. <laughs> Good job, guys. You, you overachieved. That's, that's great. Yes? One question. Can you please tell us that I'm, I'm looking at the text? The yeah, Olympus test? Yes. I'm trying to figure out where you have to find it. Okay. Um, uh, it, very indirectly. You want that right one. That yes, um, one place to, uh, so there's two places to look. Yeah, uh, 
Uh, what the question was, uh, we got this read once, we got this write once in the litmus test. What the heck, how do those map to hardware? And uh, two places to look, depending on how you want that question answered. One of them is in the, in that same directory, tools memory model, there's a linux-kernel.defs, D-E-F-S. And if you look there, you'll see how it maps into herd 7s internal representations of stuff. All right. Um, if you want to know the other piece of the story, you can look, you can look at the read once definition in uh, the Linux kernel. Uh, the short, somewhat inaccurate answer is, is a, it's just a volatile loader store. In other words, a load instruction and a store instruction. Um, the macro is uh, dazzling, um, <laughs> but but there you are. Uh, just out of curiosity, have you worked at the herd level before? Yeah. Oh, okay. You see. Uh, it's, it's rare that I see somebody say "ah" when they see when they look at a definition in the Linux kernel defs file. So I was no, curious. No, I recognize some of the things because I've been exposed to weak memory. Okay. Okay. But very good. Uh, never uh, any, any any of the files in uh, uh, tool slash memory model slash litmus dash tests. And we're gonna, have to, we're gonna have to pull these separately, I take it. Um, okay, that's a good one. Let's just do that one. Yeah, it's the first one, it'll work. It's big enough. Oh, look at that. Okay, we can even choose them. All right, very good. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, Zoom. Um, so, okay, so we got this gibberish here. What the heck is all this stuff, right? The capital C on line one at the very front there says, this is a C language litmus test. It could be, um, PPC, all caps PPC for this is a power PC litmus test. Could be ARM for so on. And there's, there's, it's, this thing has a lot of different memory models it implements. There's GPGPUs and there's C and Lord knows what else. Um, this open parent star and closed parent star, that's an OCaml comment. One of the uh, charming uh, attributes of a litmus test is in different parts of the litmus test, you use different comments. This part is, is OCamelified, so use the OCaml com complement, uh, and those of us old enough will recognize that as a Pascal comment as well. Okay, thank you. Um, the result colon never is strictly a convention. There are some scripts in the tools memory model directory that interpret that, and what they do is they'll run the litmus test and they'll look, at, look for that comment and then tell you whether it worked the way it is expected or not. And again, I use that for regression testing if there's a change in the memory model. Um, and that there's that curly brace, open curly brace, closed curly brace. That's a placeholder. Right now, we, uh, if you don't mention a global variable separately, it initializes zero, just like C does. If you want it to be some other value, instead of just open curly brace, closed curly brace, inside of there, you put like A equals one. All right, to tell it, I want this initialized to one. All right. Then we have the P0 int X, and we have P1 int Y, and I should be able to use a down arrow or something here to try. Hey, look at that. Almost as if I knew what I was doing. Must be some mistake. Go ahead. Um, probably. Uh, control shift plus is what I'd try, but I'll let the, <laughs> I'll, I'll let the official thing work on it here. Oh, look at that. Okay, yeah, that's it. Is that good? All right, we're good enough, he says. Very good, yeah, that's great. And I can I can scroll up from there, I think, anyway. Yeah, look at that. Okay, so uh, we've got this, uh, I wonder if I can, can you see my cursor by any chance? Okay, all right, great. And if, if I, yeah, so we got P0 here. And again, P0, P1, P2, P3, I've ha I have some with like 18 processes and it handles it. Oh, well, they aren't doing very much in each one, obviously. It's exponential in number of writes total. It's also exponential in number of processes. So be careful. Anyway, uh, the write once, so once you get into the curly braces, you use C style comments or C++ style comments, your choice. Um, but write once is what you'd expect it does. It just does a store. P1 um, down here is starting the, hey, look, yeah, look at that. Uh, it's starting the second process. Here we have X and Y, both global variables. So this particular process is using both of them. So we were only messing with, with X. In P0, we only need the X as a parameter. In Y, we're gonna mess with both X and Y, we need the both. We also have R0 and R1 here, and those are our local variables. 
So uh, we, we read both of them. We have a strong memory of error between them. Straightforward, uh, more or less anyway. And then P2 only takes Y. It's just writing uh, one to Y. And P3 is reading these in the, in the other order. And this is looking to me like uh, IRIW. And in fact, uh, IRIW is independent reads of independent writes. If you Google for test6.pdf, you'll get this obtuse three-page PDF uh, that has these names for classes of the litmus tests and also defines them in terms of PowerPC instructions. Uh, but that's where this came from. Anyway, so we've got this. So basically what we're asking here, can we have two different processes? One writes X, the other writes Y. And the two more processes, one reads X and Y in one order and the other reads X and Y in the other order with full barriers between them, as you can see. And then we're saying, hey, can it be that the two processes disagree on the order those writes happened in? So in other words, process one, can it see R0 as one and R1 as zero? In other words, it thinks that X got written first. And then in P3, can it see R0 equals one and R1 equals zero? And that means it thinks Y got, or excuse me, Y got written first, yes, okay. And uh, the answer should be, you can try running it right now, with the S and P and Bs in there, that can't happen. If you were to do something like uh, make the, the, and you could try making the first read be a load acquire and, uh, you know, remove the S and P and B and, and see what happens. But uh, anyway, that's a litmus test for you. Um, and you have the funny uh, ands in this case. The one colon says process one, zero, three colon says process three. We don't use zero or two's variables because we don't have any and you just got equal sign, so it's, it's pretty straightforward. And what this thing is doing is just telling you whether, when you see the output, you'll see whether all, always, sometimes, or never, this particular result happened. In this case, it should say never. It shows you the states that could happen, lists them out. Uh, there's some arguments to get herd seven to tell it, just tell me whether this can happen or not, don't bother with the other stuff, which makes it run faster, but also makes it easier to hide your bugs when you're constructing a litmus test, so be careful. Anyway, we're at uh, one o'clock. So uh, I don't want to stand in the way of, uh, let, let me stand in the way of you guys in lunch. Plus, I'm kind of hungry myself. <laughs> Thank you very much. Congratulations on getting a, a LKMM installed laptops for those that did it. And uh, have a great rest of the conference.